Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service here at Black Hall St. Columbus Church in Edinburgh. Today is Sunday the 24th of March, Palm Sunday. As always, we welcome everyone to our service, whether you're here in person, whether you're joining us online, whether you're a regular or a visitor, uh, you are most welcome. Um, I've got one congratulations notice to hand out, and that's to Les and Helen Oliver, who were both 80 this week. So many congratulations to them. I hope they had a great celebration. I think they have, because I don't think they're here. <laughs> but uh, we wish you all, all the best for that. Lots happening. Please check the website, the social media, uh, and see what's happening. I just quickly want to go over a few things. There are quite a lot. Um, we, we begin with Palm Sunday um, and we uh, start of Holy Week. So this evening, this evening in the sanctuary, we are having an evening of praise and worship songs. Um, they're going to be more, slightly more modern and contemporary than uh, some of the older and more traditional ones. So a great opportunity to start Holy Week with a, a, a service of praise and worship and hearing some of our nicer, newer songs. Uh, later on in the week, we will be having a joint service of worship with Drylaw Parish Church at Drylaw on Monday, Thursday. That's at 7 p.m., so it will be at Drylaw. And then we will have a joint service of worship with them here on Good Friday. And that's a service that will be led by the choir. Um, but we'll be having the service here at 7, both at 7 p.m. That's Thursday and Friday. Saturday, and something slightly new for us, we're going to have a movie night. We've got our film license. So at 6 p.m., uh, we're going to watch the movie Son of God. Um, I'll let you know that's a, a 12, 13 age rating, uh, and we'll do that. And then we have a very early start because, as you know, the clocks will go forward next Sunday. So we lose an hour, and our Easter breakfast service is at 8.30, 8.30, and that's on Crammond Foreshore. And we are coming together with all the churches or most of the churches in the area for that service at Crammond Foreshore before we go to the Crammond Church Halls for uh, hot drinks and hot rolls. So a busy week there ahead. Um, lot, lots happening there. A couple of other things just to note on, on general. There is a notice that's gone out to everybody on the weekly intimation sheet that the elders send out to everyone. Um, the first is about caterers I want to highlight. Lynn Bunny, who is our catering coordinator, is looking for people to identify themselves uh, and their specialities so that when we have an event, we don't end up with 24 Victoria sponges. We can, we can vary it. So if scones are your thing, or pancakes, or tiffin cake, or soup, please be in touch with Lynn Bonney. Details are on the, the, the note, uh, and let her know what you're able to provide, uh, and you can go on that list. And an appeal, and I have to do this one because it's Shona told me, um, so uh, the murder mystery tea uh, is coming up. Please, if you're interested in doing that book, we need to cater that, and it's important. A number of people, I'm told, oh, I've got that in my diary, hadn't shared that information with us. If you're wanting to go, please contact Shona or the events team to book the murder mystery tea, because there is a cap, there is a, a limit to the numbers there and some of our events have been selling out. The final notice I want to do is just to remind everybody that after the service today, we are having our stated annual meeting, the SAM, the stated annual meeting. Because of that, um, there will be an opportunity to escape after the service, but we will not be having tea or coffee this morning. So after the service, if you're not waiting for the stated annual meeting, please leave. If you are, feel free to come forward 
and use some of these vacant seats at the front uh, and that will allow us um, to, to be heard more, more easily and to hear you. So that's all the notices, all the intimations, many more that I haven't read. Please do take a look at them. They're part of the life of the congregation and an important way how we come together uh, as God's family in this place. Our call to worship comes from the lectionary psalm, Psalm 118. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. Amen. We're going to continue with our first hymn, uh, 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 an absolute must for today on Palm Sunday. It's 365, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. If you feel able, please stand and join together in singing Ride On, Ride On. And also from Psalm 118, you are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, Lord of all creation, God of all blessings, we thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see and the wonders which it cannot, for the joy that the ear may hear and for the unknown sounds of life which it cannot, for the wonders that our minds can comprehend and the universe which they cannot. We thank you for all your blessings and gifts, the gift of life, for the food and water of the earth that sustains life, for the love of family and friends without which there would be no life. Merciful God, we pray you have mercy on our souls. As we ask this, we acknowledge that we do not demonstrate your unwavering love. 
we do not offer your abundant mercy to others. We do not show the compassion you have for all your children. We judge those whom you do not. Lord, on this Palm Sunday, when we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we would see Jesus. We would love Jesus. We would follow Jesus. We would serve Jesus. And so we ask your forgiveness for all our shortcomings and for all that we repent of. Lord, create in us clean hearts. Renew your spirit within us. Do not turn us away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit. Write on our hearts your love, O God. We pray all this as we join together with the crowds of fellow worshippers hailing Jesus and saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue now with our first scripture reading, and I'll invite Sandy Weir to read for us now. The first reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, and is taken from the International Children's Bible. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. Jesus enters Jerusalem as a king. Jesus and his followers were coming closer to Jerusalem. They came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives. There Jesus sent two of his followers. He said to them, go to the town you see there when you enter it, you will find a coat tied which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here to me. If anyone asks you why you are doing this, tell him, the master needs the coat. He will send it back soon. The followers went into the town. They found a coat tied in the street near the door of a house and they untied it. Some people were standing there and asked, What are you doing? Why are you untying that coat? The followers answered the way Jesus told them to answer, and the people let them take the coat. The followers brought the coat to Jesus. They put their coats on the coat, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their coats on the road. Others cut branches in the fields and spread the branches on the road. Some of the people were walking ahead of Jesus, others were following him. All of them were shouting, Praise God! God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the kingdom of our father David. That kingdom is coming. Praise to God in heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. When he had looked at everything, and since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve apostles. Amen. We've just heard uh, uh, that well-known story to most of us, how Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and, and you can tell that his donkey had four legs and not three. 
because otherwise it would have been a wonky. Incidentally, what, what do donkeys, monkeys, and turkeys have in common? They all have keys. So, and I think about it, it's the end of the word. Uh, in our story today, we heard about how Jesus rode into Jerusalem, uh, and uh, he rode on the back of a donkey, and the crowds were waving palm branches and laid cloaks, and they, they, they cheered. Uh, I, I actually have here this rather pathetic-looking withered um, palm leaf I brought from Jerusalem. Uh, I thought it would be great to pick one of these up, but they don't travel well, and they dry out, and so my great idea to have a palm leaf uh, available for, for um, all-age addresses and the like didn't really come out. But palm trees are, are, are much, much bigger I wonder if they're called palm trees because you can hold them in your hand. But, uh, okay, I'm not, it's a hard crowd today, I can see. But uh, the palm trees are, are, are all along, all over the area around Jerusalem. And after a while, the leaves all fall off and you can find them lying in the ground. But sometimes you have to go and, and, and cut them off. And it must have been quite a sight, if you can imagine, uh, the, this crowd of people in this procession. And I want you to think, have you ever been part of a cheering crowd? Have you ever been part of a procession? Yeah, I'm seeing some nodding there. Where, where, where was that? Do you remember? No, no. A lot of people have been to Disney and they get the processions at Disney. And in this country, we have a royal family and we've got things like that. Perhaps somebody's supporting a sports team um, so there's lots of occasions where you've got flags waving and people cheering and crowds. I wonder if it would be more fun to be one of the disciples, though, you know, walking alongside Jesus. That way there's a bit of reflected glory. Jesus is being, being hailed, but actually walking beside or behind Jesus as the crowds cheered, somebody might be taking some reflective glory in that. Lots of people watching and feeling pretty good about being there. But I want to think and go back to the very beginning of the story. Do you remember what Jesus said to two of his disciples before the parade began? He didn't tell them to follow the parade. He didn't tell them uh, to, to, to go and collect the palm trees or branches. People just did that on their own. Jesus said to of his followers, and he said to them, go to the town you see there. When you enter it, you will find a colt tied, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here to me. Probably not a very exciting job. Of all the things Jesus asked people to do, it's probably quite a boring job, go and get a, a, a donkey. The disciples probably didn't even really understand what it is or why they were being asked to do this. But the thing is, it was important to Jesus, and it was important to his plans. It's a bit like planning a party in your house. You go to the shops to make sure there's snacks and there's all the various different things that are ready for the party. There's lots of other jobs like tidying the house beforehand or, you know, cleaning your room, if that's something you ever do. Uh, but, 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 you know, these are things that are sometimes boring jobs, sometimes unpleasant jobs, but they go a long way to making things better for everyone else. We have lots of people that do that in the church here. With people that make and serve tea and coffee. Not today, though, it's the Sam. We've got people who work to put the heating on before we arrive. There's people offer lifts to one another. We have people working on the AV team. We don't just arrive and have these beautiful flowers magically appear. Someone has given up their time to come and prepare them. And again, they give up time later on to deliver these flowers to people. 
There are so many small, unseen jobs. The gardeners out in the garden making our church, our church grounds look wonderful, and the two yellow daffodil crosses are starting to come up either side of the entranceway. All these, and far, far more than I've mentioned, are really important jobs, but many of them aren't very exciting at the time. And that's what I want us to take from this. Sometimes God wants us to do things that don't seem important, but when each of us does that small thing, it makes a huge difference for everyone. Even if you're not in a specific rota for a specific job, there are things everybody can do every week. You can, you can look around at the people around you. You can greet them and be cheerful. You can say, I'm glad you're here. You can sing songs as part of our worship. All these things are great for helping us to come together to worship God. No job is unimportant when we're worshiping God. I suspect the disciples who were told to get a donkey weren't very excited about doing that, but they did it anyway. I'm not sure the people who went and cut the palm trees had a lot of fun getting them, but they did it. If God is asking us to do something, there's no job that's beneath us or that's unimportant. Every job that helps someone to glorify God and worship Him is an important job. Amen. I'm going to sing a new hymn now. I know you love that, but it's an old tune. This is a, a song from a, a book I've got, Songs to Shake Them Up. Uh, it's called, Come and Welcome This King on a Donkey. So please, um, it's done, as I say, to a well-known tune, but please join together in singing, Come and Welcome This King on a Donkey. So as some of our younger ones leave for Sunday club uh, and they uh, go to have their time, we will hear Sandy read our second scripture reading. The second reading is taken from the Gospel according to John. Chapter 12, verses 12 to 16, and it's from the New Revised Standard Version. 
John chapter 12, verses 12 to 16. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Amen, and to God be all the glory. Thank you, Sandy. We continue our worship now with an anthem sung by the choir. Please sit and listen to the choir as they sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As I think most of you now know, the revised common lectionary uh, runs on a three-year program. In year A, we hear Matthew's version of events, and in year C, Luke's. As we are presently in year B, for the most part, we will hear from the gospel according to Mark and his version of what happened. But some events in Jesus' life are so important that the lectionary also gives us access to the version in the gospel according to John. And that allows us to hear all four versions. Uh, and in particular for today, we get access to all four accounts of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Within the three-year cycle of the lectionary, uh, we get this year to choose from either Mark or John, but uh, I kind of circumvented that by using Mark's gospel for the all age and John's for our second reading. Palm Sunday has created an enduring image of Jesus riding into the city, signaling the start of the countdown to the end of his ministry here on earth. There are so many questions that have been asked and are asked about this event. What did Jesus intend? What were the disciples thinking? What went through the heads of the bystanders, the crowds or the authorities? 
what's shaped the telling of the incident by the gospel writers. Many more questions besides. The narrative, as it's told in the synoptic gospels, is one that's filled with numerous cultural memories for the Jewish people. They begin with the prophecy that's told in Zechariah chapter 9, which tells of the coming ruler of God's people. That verse spoke of a Messiah whose power was tempered with humility. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your King comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is He, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. These cultural memories continue with the people spreading their garments. This was a spontaneous gesture of respect which echoed the welcome to the king written about in Second Kings chapter 9. Then hurriedly they took their cloaks and spread them for him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Yehu is king. It's from Psalm 118 that the cries came, Blessed is the one that comes in the name of the Lord, and Hosanna. And further on, it's from First Maccabees chapter 13, one of the deuterocanonical or apocryphal books of the Bible, that an earlier Jewish hero reclaimed the city and was received. It's written there, the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments and with hymns and songs because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. So we can see that the whole account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem in the synoptic gospels resonates with prophecy and echoes of past glory for the Jewish people. Whilst the gospel according to John's version is derived from these three synoptic gospels and writers, it omitted much of the detail. However, whilst it omits quite a lot, John's gospel provides two significant additional details. First, there was added a verse from Psalm 118. It was verse 22, which made a link with the passion narrative. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The second addition explained how the account had come down to us in the way that it had. John wrote in verse 16 that his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. With hindsight, the disciples only understood later the meaning of what had happened at the time. When I was in the police service every morning from Monday to Friday, there used to be a senior officers meeting. And the meeting was there to brief the divisional commander and allow for analysis and what had happened the previous 24 hour period. On a Monday, we covered the whole weekend. It was always the duty of the early shift response inspector to attend these meetings, and they would be called upon to explain the actions of the officers who attended and had dealt with the incidents at the time. Personally, I found the meetings highly political and full of people trying to promote their own agendas and try and make themselves look good, sometimes at the expense of others. I always used to make a point of seeing if there was an ongoing incident that I could attend that would justify my non-attendance at the meeting. Unfortunately, well, for me anyway, there were never enough serious incidents at that time in the morning, and I would have to attend the meetings and try to explain, and sometimes 
have to argue and try to justify the officers, the actions of officers who'd attended incidents and made on-the-spot decisions under difficult circumstances and often under extreme pressure. It always surprised me, and, and indeed I'll be confess to annoy, being annoyed that some of the people at these meetings who spent their working day sitting at a desk behind a computer felt justified in using perfect hindsight to second guess and sometimes criticize others for their actions in the heat of the moment. There was one particular superintendent who had arrived from Paisley after we became Police Scotland. He'd been based in Tayside Police for most of his career. And uh, at these meetings, he would regularly question why initial officers at the scene didn't just do this or didn't just do that. Why didn't they just do this? One week, the man, particular, that particular superintendent, was made night shift superintendent. And a call came in for a disturbance in the Fergusley Park area of Paisley, which may be known to some people here. The report was quite serious, and several stations acknowledged and attended. I arrived at the same time as the night shift superintendent's driver brought him, and so we were the first officers on the scene. I ran upstairs, followed by him, to be greeted by I have to confess a relatively typical party scene gone wrong in the area. It was chaos. Three people had been stabbed. About a dozen drunk individuals were all wandering about, screaming their own interpretations of what had happened and what we should or shouldn't do about it. And we still had a male running about with a knife. I have to confess, I did at that time take a, an unchristian pleasure from turning to the superintendent and saying to him, as the senior officer, how would you like to prioritize this? <laughs> Faced with a, a real life situation, as my own shift began to arrive, he, he muttered how happy he was for me to take charge and then extricated himself from the scene. It did, I think, uh, go a long way to allowing him to see the difficulties that officers sometimes faced at the time, and he did become less prone to saying, why did they not just do this uh, at future incidents? Uh, I'm sure there's many other people like that, and many of you here will have come across others in your own capacities that will speak with great authority with perfect hindsight. They become experts on what has been, on what is already certain, and can make judgments on that basis about what should have been done at the time. If only things were that simple. Hindsight can be helpful, and it can inform ourselves about what has happened and why, but we cannot live by looking constantly in the rearview mirror. To live our best lives, we must look forward in faith, not backwards. Soren Kierkegaard, who lived in the early 1800s, was a Danish theologian, a philosopher, poet, social critic, and religious author who's widely considered to be the first existentialist philosopher. In 1843, Kierkegaard wrote, life must be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. I think this is so true. On a personal basis, I have only ever been able to properly discern what I believe to be God at work in my life when looking backwards. I can see when looking backwards various experiences and happenings in my life that I believe has been God working to prepare me for what was to come. I personally have never had a road to Damascus experience where I've seen with startling clarity God's purpose for me. But what I have experienced are numerous incidences when looking back, I believe God has led 
And God has been at work in my life to bring me to where I am now. These have sometimes been relatively small things. I remember at my home church, we ran an alpha course, and it ran over eight consecutive weeks. There was no way that I, as a shift worker, would ever get eight Thursdays off in a row. However, a combination of being put on courses, changes to duties, and getting certain court dates conspired to make me available for the whole course. I remember once when on a charity trek somewhere in the Amazonian jungle, a fellow trekker also from Scotland quite randomly, in my view, said, oh, I'll bet you're asked to be an elder in the church when you get back home. I laughed at the time and told him not to be ridiculous, but the seed was planted, and in returning home within a month, I had been asked and accepted the calling to become an elder. I could go on and on, and I've no doubt if you each look back in your lives you may have experienced occasions when that sort of thing has happened, when God has been at work in your lives. Each one could possibly be easily dismissed as coincidence, but I don't think it is. Reflecting backwards is helpful to understand where we are, but dwelling on it does not help with decision-making when living life and moving forwards. The only benefit in looking backwards for me is that I understand that cumulatively these events have brought me to a growing conviction that God is at work in my life, and I believe in each and every person's life, and leads us if only we will listen and try to do His will. This is how we need to live our lives, moving forward in faith that God is in our lives and has plans for us. That's the really hard bit. Looking backwards is easy. Remember the gospel passage. The disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Our task, as Kierkegaard put it, is to live our lives forward. We have to take the knowledge that we have of the past and use it to inform our decision-making now so as to how we are going to live our lives in the future. Today, we think about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We think about the crowds of people who welcomed him, shouting Hosanna, and about the later crowds who would condemn him, shouting crucify him. The question for us as followers of Jesus, with all the knowledge that we have of what has gone before, is what kind of crowd do we want to be part of moving forward? Are we on the side of the status quo, the side of the powers that be with their inequality and justice, an equal share of resources and use of war and destruction to achieve their aims? Or do we want to be on the side of God's rule with its non-violent, creative movement for peace, justice, and love of all people? This Easter, do we join the crowd shouting Hosanna, welcoming Jesus into our lives, or the ones shouting crucify him and rejecting his teachings and God's reconciliation? Amen. We're going to continue with our next hymn now. It's number 367, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Please, if you're able, stand and join together singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
Our offering scripture sentence comes from Deuteronomy chapter 16. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Amen. As our offerings brought forward, we're going to remain seated and sing our offering hymn, Two Little Fishes. Almighty God, as you have given yourself to us, so we give ourselves to you. We pray that our offerings of time, talent, and treasure, given here today and elsewhere at other times, be blessed by you, that they may be used for your purpose, your kingdom, and your glory. Amen. In a slight change to the published order of service, where we're going to do something slightly different, um, I, I mentioned during my sermon about an Alpha course that I had been on, and I, I found it a, a, a very worthwhile a, a, and um, a, a, a great benefit to me in, in consolidating my, my thinking. And we've announced before, and it's out in the intimations, that we as a church are, are planning to run another Alpha course, uh, and that's beginning on Thursday the 4th of April at 7.30 p.m., um, and it's in the Starbucks at Craigleith Retail Road, so you're guaranteed a good coffee, uh, if nothing else, but uh, I think it'll be far, far more to it than that. I've mentioned before, for those who haven't heard of Alpha, it's a series of group conversations that freely explore the basics of Christian faith. And it's done in an open and a friendly environment. Everybody is welcome, no matter what your background, your beliefs, you're invited to come along and share your own thoughts and hear other people's thoughts and think about these things. They can be very formative um, experiences. Uh, these events. You don't need to go to every single one of them if you can't manage, um, but uh, they are well worth considering. And we're going to watch a video now of somebody from the church who has been on an Alpha uh, course recently and what it meant for them. And he's reiterating the fact that you don't need to be new to the Christian faith to consider doing this. We'll watch that video now. Good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I'm away with my family this weekend celebrating a birthday. My own, as it happens. <clears throat> uh, so, Donald Cameron asked me to say a few words about my experience of the Alpha course that St. Columbus ran, I think, about three years ago now. What can I say? For me, it was nothing short of transformational for my faith. Like many of you, I suspect, I was brought up in a church. I joined the church when I was 18, and with a few gaps, some rather longer than others, uh, I've been going to pretty much attended church all my life. <clears throat> in that time, I have to say, there have been times I have felt very close to God. And there have been other times when I felt quite distant from God. I've had periods of feeling real certainty with my faith and periods of almost 
crippling doubts. Although I don't think I've ever really doubted the existence of God. Taking part in Alpha just ended that, that cycle. And as I listened to the videos week by week, the penny, the penny finally dropped for me that as a Christian, my salvation came from Jesus and my faith was in Jesus, the Son of God. That may sound obvious, but it really took the Alpha courses for that to just sink into me properly. Making Jesus the focus of my faith and the, the centre of my life became my new goal. The course also dealt with the Holy Spirit and made me realise in a way that I hadn't quite understood before, that as soon as I believed in Jesus and followed him, I am promised the Holy Spirit and therefore the Holy Spirit is within me. Now, these revelations came on gradually as the course went on, but they completely changed how I feel about my faith. I had a new certainty in my life of God's love and presence, a new certainty of the promise of forgiveness for past sins and of eternal life with Jesus in heaven eventually. This had a very definite uh, outcome in November 2022. Most of you will know that I was diagnosed with a blood cancer called multiple myeloma. When I was told what that diagnosis was, I just felt God put his arms around me. And it was as if I was wrapped in God's love and I had a great sense of peace that I felt was given to me. I didn't worry about the illness then and I have never worried about it since. I just sense that it is all in God's hands and I can place my trust totally in him. So I went on the Alpha course, having been a church member for almost 50 years, and I found it just about the best thing I've ever done. I can only highly recommend it to you and pray that you will go and that you will get out of it as much as I did. God bless. On a personal basis, I, I'd like to thank Adrian for sharing what is a very personal testimony, uh, and I hope that speaks to some of you. And if people are interested, there's leaflets. Speak to Donald Cameron. Speak to myself if you're interested. Register your interest. As I say, it's, it's, you don't need to make every single Thursday, but it's well worth considering, uh, and we can look at that. So um, please do take that into prayerful consideration and do so as we continue now with our closing prayers. Let us pray. Redeeming God, in your great compassion, hear our prayers for the world. We pray for the whole church, all the people of God, all who respond to the call of Jesus to follow me. Guide us that your church may do your will and evidence your redeeming love for all. We pray for our nation and for all the nations of the earth. We pray for all who govern and are called to lead others. May they follow your teachings and live for the betterment of others and put the needs of all before the needs of the few. We pray for all those who hunger and thirst, those whose lives are blighted by the inequality of access to resources, those without a place to lay their head because they are homeless, a refugee, or an, an asylum seeker. 
We pray for those who cry out for justice and strive for equality and fairness. Those who live under the threat of terror and persecution for what they believe or who they are. May they hear of joy and gladness May those who are broken rejoice in the knowledge of your love for them. We pray for all those who are ill, those in pain, those under stress, and those who are bereaved. Give them the peace that only you can give and sustain them with your Holy Spirit. We especially pray for those people and those situations that are known to each one of us personally. And we do so as we bring them to you in our hearts. Lord Jesus, as we prepare our hearts to remember your death and resurrection, grant us the strength and the wisdom to serve and follow you this day and always. Amen. Our final hymn is All Glory, Laud, and Honor, and we're going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5. It's number 364 in the hymn books, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Please join together in singing verses 1, 4, and 5. living our lives forwards in faith that our past experience gives us, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.